Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to MesosCon. Uh, my name is Alex Gaudio, and I'm here to talk to you today about challenges in optimizing job scheduling on Mesos. Um, so I have to apologize. I'm a little bit sick, so if I cough, I'll try to cough away from the mic. <laughs> um, but I'm very excited to talk to you all today. Uh, and so let's see how it goes. Uh, so who am I? Um, I'm a data scientist and engineer at a company called Sailthrough in New York. I'm a Mesos user, and I'm also the creator of an auto-scaling framework for Mesos called Relay.Mesos. Um, I do distributed computation and machine learning at Sailthrough. Uh, we've been using Mesos for about a year and a half, actually. Uh, and we use it in production, and it's great. Use it all the time, obviously. Uh, yeah, my name is Fernando. So what are the goals of this talk today? So there's give you an understanding of the problem of job scheduling uh, using some basic principles. So kind of starting from the ground up. And then two is uh, learn some ways to think about, uh, use or develop Mesos more effectively, and have some fun along the way. So. Uh, I hope this is a fun talk, something like that. <laughs> um, and really, I want to talk about two things. One is the problem of utilization, and two is how does Mesos do or not do job scheduling? And so if you think about this talk as a trajectory, it goes pretty simple for about the first half, just to kind of put everyone on the same ground, right? This is the first talk of the day. Uh, and then I'll go more detail in the second half. Um, but I think everybody should be engaged along the way. And if you're not, tell me afterwards. <laughs> um, so when you think about the problem of utilization, right, you're really talking about a box. So here's a box. And a box has three dimensions. It has width, length, and height. Um, so you can represent a box these way, this way with these three dimensions. And my question is, what can you do with a box that has three dimensions? And oh my god, what does this mean, right? Where am I going? Well, you can stuff the box uh, or overstuff it. You can unpack the box, put a box in a box. You can carry the box. And really, at the end of the day, it's all about a box. So a real world example of this is, right, please efficiently pack all of these stolen boxes in my getaway car. And UPS solves this all the time. Robbers from banks have to solve variants of this problem, right? Uh, this is the problem of utilization in one form or another. And so why am I saying this? So a box is really just an analogy for a few things. And it's an analogy for a computer. So if a computer is really a box, and we can represent a box in three dimensions, well, if we relabeled those three dimensions uh, to disk, RAM, and CPU, all of a sudden we've represented a computer with three dimensions. So this is a very important concept. Because now what we've said is a computer in one form or other is just a collection of these resources. So we can put, you know, you can stuff flour into the jar, right? You can put stuff in boxes. What can you put in a computer? Well, I'm going to say processes, okay? So this is the output of PS3, which I'm sure pretty much everyone here is probably familiar with. Um, and I'm going to tell you that this is an interesting slide. So why is this interesting? Well, for one, it introduces a process as an instance of code that accesses resources over time. Um, and this concept of accessing resources is important, right? Because you can use them, share them, steal, lock or release them, so on and so forth. Um, and not only is there one process, but there are multiple processes on the, slot, on the PS3 output. So a computer running multiple processes means that they have to share resources. and that processes are categorized into a kind of structure. Uh, and this is a very powerful thing to realize because now you can really start to answer, ask questions about utilization, right? So why don't computers have one process per box? And is it inefficient to have so many processes on one box? And aren't processes really just another kind of box, right? And so you have the box in the box question. So I, I want to kind of try to answer these questions in this first half of the talk. Um, and so if you think about this one more way, if you imagine you have a two-dimensional computer, so just CPU and RAM, okay? And on your, and let's say on your 
two-dimensional computer, only three types of processes run, right? So process one uses a ton of CPU, but a little bit of RAM. Process two uses a different amount. Process three uses a different amount, okay? And the questions are, <coughs> excuse me, what can we do with these processes, right? So there's a, and the, there's a fixed number of ways we can use up the resources. We could do one process at a time. And this works really great if all the processes were the size of the computer. However, what we see here is that obviously process two just sucks. It's too small. Or the machine is too big. Um, so we're, we have a lot of gray that's underutilized. So what can we do? Well, we can start adding in more processes, right? And this, so now we have two processes running. We've introduced, again, the concept of shared state. Very important concept. Uh, and it has a lot of implications. Um, and with shared state, well, you all of a sudden have all these utilization strategies you can start to employ to decide how to fill up the box. And so one strategy could be to maximize the variation in tasks. And you can see that we're using all the different task types we have, but all of a sudden we have these gray spots that mean we're underutilized. Um, on the contrary, you could say, well, I just want to maximize my utilization, right? So process one fills up almost perfectly, um, but there's no, no variation in the tasks. And if you were to think about, well, eventually I need to run task two and three, if you look at task three, this is a good example of, well, oh shit, what happened? <laughs> you know, um, I have this gray underutilized area, but I also have this uh, weird double red spot kind of on the right, right, where you have resources competing uh, sorry, processes competing for the same resources, and it's kind of unclear what this really means. Um, and so the problem of utilization, very simply, is just a multidimensional problem that is very, very complicated. Uh, that's a Kandinsky print, by the way. It's really, I like it. So, um, so some takeaways from kind of that are there are many ways you can use a computer's resources, and different uh, factors inform how we can choose to utilize a set of resources. And when I introduce the concept of shared state, right, shared state is a great thing for many reasons. Uh, for one, it uh, increases your utilization, okay? So hardware is kind of this thing, it's not really that flexible, so you're kind of stuck with a, a box of a known size. Uh, and then you also get the flexibility to do different things at once, and because you have uh, this flexibility and this increased utilization, you all of a sudden have these different ways of doing it. So it makes a lot of fun problems, or I think they're fun. I don't know, I don't know. some people might not think so. Um, but the trade-off is, you know, you get all these fun problems to solve. <laughs> so you have things that we're all very familiar with, context switching, out of memory errors, network and I.O. congestion, uh, and then that's like in the realm of competition for resources. Then you also have predictability, right? Are uh, things, things are constantly changing and you have this dynamic system, things all of a sudden become a little bit more non-deterministic uh, and you have like feedback loops. Um, all very interesting problems, but they are drawbacks of shared state because you've just suddenly made your system a lot more complicated. So, so far all of this has just been talking about really kind of one, the idea of one machine, right? You have one machine, a host of problems, and operating systems are complicated. Um, and your operating system, and specifically your laptop's kernel, right, is designed to solve these problems very well. So, hold on a minute. Like, if we've only talked about one machine, why don't we just all have one machine? And this is a Mesos conference, so what about Mesos? Okay. So, pro obviously one machine isn't enough, right? Problems of scale mean you have too much data, not enough compute power, and you can't communicate everything to, you know, you can't have all... Uh, 50,000 clients connecting to one database, for instance. Uh, and then reliability and availability are also problems. You have single points of failure, lack of redundancy, and so on and so forth. So, on to many machines. And this is where kind of Mesos is maybe angel or devil, I don't know. <laughs> it's, um, so if we recall the analogy of a computer is just a box, right? Well, then Mesos is also, I'm going to argue, just a box. And it's, if it's also just a box, it's also just a computer. This is a double analogy, and what do I mean by this? Well, 
Mesos is really a distributed computer, right? If you go to the website, that's what they say. Um, and what's important to think about this is you have a lot of machines all solving similar problems, and we need ways to tell the machines what to do. So if you think about just like an operating system, you're building a, all the components of an operating system in a distributed system, okay? Uh, and the concept is you're repeating history a little bit. So you get the dinosaur, you get your in your new form, right? You get your awesome new technology with the same old problems. So uh, now I kind of want to, now that we're kind of all on the same page a little bit, how does Mesos do job scheduling? So Mesos is a big box, we'll call it the grid, right? And the little boxes are slaves. And if you imagine that each slave is a partitioned <coughs> pool of resources, right? You have a lot of little boxes inside of your big box, okay? And Basically what happens, kind of as a refresher again, uh, is the slaves advertise the size of their box to the Mesos master, and they say, of my resources, this is how many I have available. Uh, and then the master packages those into offers, and then gives those offers to frameworks, and then the frameworks accept or reject the offers, and accepted offers result in tasks that do useful work. Okay, so how much of this is total reviewed, everyone? <coughs> Okay, cool, so am I going, okay, that's good. So, um, are there any questions on that so far? Because this is like how Mesos works. Okay, um, I mean, from a scheduling point of view. So there are three types of scheduling architectures for uh, distributed kernels, and Mesos, this one that I just kind of very quickly described is a two-level architecture. Um, and part of these slides actually come from the Google Omega white paper, so I'm, I'm stealing from them. Um, they're good pictures. And if you think about what two-level means, you really have this concept where you split the scheduling in two, okay? So you have in that, in blue, you have your cluster state, the state of your grid. And, <coughs> excuse me. And on the left, you have kind of this thing that manages the resources. And for Mesos, also manages framework state, right? And then on the right, you have uh, the frameworks themselves that are managing task state, okay? And two-level scheduling is different than monolithic scheduling because the monolithic scheduler tries to do everything in one big uh, kind of computational unit. It's, that's what, it's monolithic. Uh, and it's also different than the shared state scheduler uh, in a couple different ways, which I'll go into later. Uh, the primary one, I think, being that one is pessimistic and one is optimistic. So the goal, <coughs> and definitely according to Google Omega, this is the goal, uh, is to move towards shared state. And I definitely agree with this goal. Um, and if you think about where Mesos is, this, sorry, this slide's a little cut off. Uh, Mesos is kind of in between two level and shared state. And then if you look at the other ones, they might, I don't know, I kind of made stuff up, right? Borg is probably over towards monolithic. Uh, Yarn is somewhere in between. And then Omega is probably somewhere in shared state land. Um, and these are actually very similar to a computer kernels where you have kind of your monolithic kernel uh, on the left, your uh, hybrid kernel on the right, all the way on the right, and then your like micro kernel in the middle. It's a similar concept for one machine. And <clears throat> so given this kind of understanding, I want to kind of point out maybe some weaknesses with Mesos that prevent it from being a shared state kernel. Uh, that can make Mesos very challenging to use, actually. Um, and then also point out some ways to work around these or you know, things we might want to focus on fixing. So the first is this, con uh, sorry, this concept of optimistic versus pessimistic offers. And <clears throat> so what does that really mean? Well, optimism and pessimism is really pretty easy to understand. <clears throat> From an optimism level uh, point of view, right, you trust everyone, okay? And then a pessimistic person can trust no one. And if you think about this in terms of parking your car, right, if everyone promised not to take my spot, I can, I can then assume, trust, and trust that nobody will steal my place. 
And so when I leave my parking spot, I'll just leave it and nobody will take it. That's an optimistic point of view. A pessimistic one is really more where you don't trust that people are going to not take your spot. So you put something in the way to physically block them, right? So locking scenarios and things like that. This is pessimistic. And uh, Mesos is pessimistic. Uh, and they're actually working on making it more optimistic. So a trust no one uh, situation. And what do I mean by this? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Me what Mesos does is it assumes that two frameworks sharing the same resources uh, is not a safe thing to do. So um, when you have a chunk of resources in Mesos currently, it's only offered to a single scheduler at a time. And this actually can cause a lot of problems, and here's why. So when a framework receives an offer for resources, it can either make an immediate decision about what it wants to do with the offer, which is great, or it can hold on to the offer forever in a state of indecision. Okay, so the red is bad, um, green is, is good. And why is holding on for, to an offer forever not so great? Well, uh, it leads to underutilized, util, sorry, underutilization. So basically, if you're holding on to an offer, uh, the master can't re-offer that currently to anyone else. And so when you're building frameworks, you really want to release offers as fast as possible so that the rest of the cluster can be utilized. Um, and because of this fact, you can, it can also become very hard to schedule um, large tasks. Okay. <clears throat> and because it's hard to schedule large tasks, then all of a sudden frameworks say, well, I have these large tasks to schedule, so I'm just going to hold on to resources until I have enough that I can schedule my large task. And all of a sudden you have this system kind of, people start gaming the system and then it falls apart. Um, I mean, it doesn't fall apart, it just stops being more efficient. And so you could also imagine people going nuts on this, right? Well, if I can create many instances of a framework to get more total offers, I can kind of pool all these together and then at some point or other, I'll like release them all. This is a bad idea, don't do it. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so what, what can you do to kind of prevent this? Well, there's a few things, right? So offer timeouts you can, is an option that currently exists in Mesos. You can set shorter timeouts so that what happens is if you have a framework that receives an offer and it takes too long for it to decide what to do, Mesos will rescind the offer and give it to someone else. Um, that's really great. I, I think offer timeout should just be a default on everything of a couple seconds. And then, uh, well, depending on your task time. And then another thing you could do is wait for optimistic offers. So this is a really cool idea. Uh, and it's basically the idea that you can send one offer to multiple frameworks, um, but rescind the offer when necessary. So what you all of a sudden have is kind of many, place, many things at the same time receiving an offer. And then uh, uh, you have kind of uh, this the, the one that uses it most efficiently kind of running. Uh, and then there are some other ones happening, uh, other tickets happening also kind of related to this area that I didn't uh, put into this slide. Um, but I'm sure that over the course of the day you'll, you'll find others. Um, so that's kind of optimistic and pessimistic offers. So the next one I want to talk about is uh, the dominant resource fairness. Yeah? Does that actually exist, this uh, 1607? Yeah, it exists. If you go to um, the Jira Mesos page and look for Mesos 1607, you'll find it. Well, I can do that. I can send an offer to multiple uh, They're working on they're, the tickets in progress. I'm not a Mesos developer, um, so if you know anyone feels like jumping in, go for it. Um, <laughs> so the next thing I want to talk about is the dominant resource fairness algorithm and the framework sorter. Um, so the concept of the DRF and framework sort is really this concept of kind of a choice, of sorting, actually. Right? You have two doors. Which one do I open first? And in Mesos, Mesos has all these offers that are packaged up. And it says, well, I have all these different frameworks that might want offers. Which ones do I give them to first? 
okay? And this is a very important problem to solve in a pessimistic system, um, less important to solve in an optimistic system. And uh, let's, I wanna kind of go into how this works uh, and then talk about it a little bit more. So basically, DRF is a method for prioritizing which frameworks to uh, give a resource offer to first, right? And how does this work? Well, if you imagine that you have a framework and you imagine that you can represent your framework in, in this case, four dimensions, okay? You can say, you know, uh, all the way on the left I have this framework using 12% of the total CPU across my entire cluster, 30% of the total RAM across my entire cluster, and disk and port, port address space, yada, 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 okay? And what you've just done is represented a framework in four dimensions. And from that, you say, well, the dominant resource is the one that has the highest bar. So in this case, uh, framework XYZ's resource usage is, or dominant resource is 30% RAM. And if you do this for all frameworks running on Mesos at a given time, um, point in time, you can identify all frameworks by their dominant resource, okay? So framework one has the most and two has the least. And um, what, what this means is framework two has the minimum dominant share of resources. And what DRF does is basically say, well, I'm going to offer resources to the first, to the framework with the lowest minimum dominant share. So in this picture, right, framework two is the lowest, then three, then one, right? So it goes framework two, three, one. And uh, as long as resources are, are available, two first, three first, one first, and one last. Um, and then there's a kind of addition to, uh, additional kind of aspect to this where, and this is a very important thing to kind of grasp, I think, where if your framework, if you know ahead of time that one framework just kind of wants more tasks than another, and that difference is more or less static, you can say, well, I know that framework one in general actually wants more tasks than the 30%, or more, sorry, dominant share than the 30%, so I'm gonna give it a little bit more. And framework two also wants a lot more, so I'll give it a lot more. And framework three actually wants a lot less, right? And so what you've basically done by adding weights is just change the height of the bars. And then you can, when, once you change the height of the bar, you can kind of go through uh, with this whole sorting algorithm and sorting process, I mean, and just choose the, you know, uh, lowest bar first. And so, okay, so any questions so far? Cool. So uh, when is dominant resource fairness working uh, well? Well, if you assume that all frameworks have work to do, right, everyone's in the cluster, every framework in the cluster is spinning up tasks and just kind of hungry for more stuff. This will work great. Um, and if you also assume that a framework's kind of hunger level for more resources doesn't change over its lifetime, this is also great. Um, and then you should also know ahead of time, or, or if you know ahead of time that there's different hunger levels, but you know what kind of how hungry framework A is compared to framework B, right, you can kind of compensate for that using a weighting scheme. And, okay, so now you might be able to s start wondering, well, okay, so when is this bad? Um, what if you have a framework that just doesn't want any tasks while a whole bunch of others do? Well, what ends up happening, I'll show in a couple slides, is that the ones that do get starved out because you have your minimum dominant share dominated by the uh, frameworks that don't want to spin up any tasks. And, uh, if you have this concept of hunger, right, and the hunger changes over time, what you're doing is imagining like an estimated, uh, I should have drawn this slide. You're imagining, imagining kind of one of these bars, and it's cha if it's changing over time for this framework, like if you imagine what it would want, ideally want to be, if it changes over time, then uh, you're causing, um, it just won't work very well in, with the current implementation of DRF. So here are some pictures to kind of go through this one more time. 
So if framework four's ideal state is that it always just wants 30 tasks, and, right, more or less, something like this, and then framework six always wants 50, um, this kind of is a district, you have a task distribution among your frameworks, and this can be healthy as long as it doesn't change, and according to the examples of good and bad before, right? Um, but when you get into situations like this where all of a sudden your ideal distribution is that all these first four frameworks just want nothing to do with kind of spinning up stuff on Mesos, they still get resource offers all the time. And in fact, be, uh, they get resources more often than framework six will. So if framework six wants 50 tasks, it may never get you know, above 10 tasks or something. These are made up numbers, but um, what ends up happening is framework six gets starved for resources. Okay, and this kind of is a pain in the butt, um, or it can be a pain in the butt, depending on your scenario. Um, and so examples of this in the real world are when you have a framework that spins up tasks based on a queue. If that queue is ever empty, it's getting a lot of resources and probably it looks like its efficiency is great, but the efficiency of other frameworks in your system starts to, they start to get starved out. And all of a sudden you're looking at your cluster and wondering, why is there no utilization? Well, it could be because of this problem. Um, another example of this is you have a web server framework that uh, sometimes gets, doesn't get a lot of requests, okay? And what ends up happening is it gets tons of offers, so it can always fulfill the requests, but the busy guys like maybe the database or something that has a lot of work to do while the web server has nothing to do, kind of, they get starved out. And so you end up with the weird problems like that. And then a database, you know, a database can also have anything that can't have, that at times has nothing to do, that is a framework, uh, will suffer from this problem. So what are some workarounds or solutions? And, uh, well, the easiest thing to say is I could just ensure that all my frameworks always are, are always hungry for tasks. They always want to spin up more stuff. But as we just saw in those previous examples, it's, it can be impossible to do that if, like if your queue is, if you're serving requests and there's just no request to serve, you all of a sudden have a framework doing nothing. So then you say, well, okay, I can work around this by making my framework really inefficient, right? Or I can make it serving, serve all these kind of side requests. And that just, just don't do that. <laughs> there's better ways to work around it. <coughs> um, so another thing you might be able to do is write your own allocation algorithm. Um, so I've actually done some work on this, but I decided not to present that in this talk because this is first in the morning. Um, but if you want to see an example of this, uh, I don't know who this person is, but go to their talk, Legion, Preemptive Task Scheduling. They'll talk about their modifications of DRF and, and probably some other talks today, too. Um, you could also just wait for optimistic offers and hope it'll figure itself out. If you don't see that you have underutilized resources, you know, maybe you don't care that much. Um, and then you could also allow frameworks to periodic. So this is an interesting idea. So allow frameworks to periodically restart themselves to define a different DRF rating, uh, weighting every time they realize that their hunger level changes. So if you imagine that framework A kind of knows that it's, it just wants a lot of resources and then it can predict that in the next you know, short while it'll actually want nothing, maybe it'll restart itself and say, okay, I don't want any resources, thank you, Mesos, or you know, you could even just shut off the, turn off the framework for a period of time. Um, I think this is a good solution <laughs> with big quotes around it, right? Uh, it's kind of a hack. Um, and then, kind of, if I, if I speculate on this a little bit, a really good dynamic weighting algorithm should really benefit by the knowledge of the distribution of weights by other frameworks across the system. And what this basically means is kind of, if you think about what shared state really is, right, you have this grid and every framework knows the state of utilization in the cluster at a given point in time. Um, and if you can kind of move towards that concept, it's a very, it's a great thing, a very powerful thing to, very empowering thing to be able to do. So with a system like this, 
kind of frameworks could start to compete a little bit more with each other in a healthy way based on their knowledge of the system. Um, and it makes Mesos more like a shared state scheduler. Uh, so the kind of last part of this talk um, is really I want to go over the missing APIs um, and some enhancements that can possibly exist. So these are my opinions. I'm not even sure whether like I totally agree with some of the things I'm about to say. So if you don't agree, let's get drinks later. Uh, or raise your hand and point me out. <laughs> um, so I don't think that the framework sorter is kind of like uh, changing DRF is the cure-all to everything. Uh, I don't even know that optimistic offers will take us like all the way to shared state. But they'll, they'll do a pretty good job. So I think we get a, a lot of mileage out of them. Um, but really what I would say is that frameworks should more actively leverage statistics uh, about resource utilization and about the state of the system in order to inform a master about how it should be allocated. So this kind of, you can imagine, uh, this kind of br introduces the concept of like predictability, right? If a framework, the idea is that if a framework knows its resource needs and more importantly its future resource needs better than the master does, well it should be able to tell the master that look dude, I'm about to be really slammed or look, I have nothing to do, don't, don't just leave me alone for a little while. Uh, and kind of communication APIs like this uh, between the, like that are dynamic and between the framework and the scheduler uh, exist to some extent but I think they could really be fleshed out a little bit more. Um, and also, in empowering frameworks like this lets them be a little bit smarter in how they wish to populate the grid. Okay, um, so I think there's a lot of effort kind of moving in this direction. So, uh, so I, it's a great thing. Um, right, I kind of already said this. Uh, and then, an additional idea to this is kind of. If you let the framework developers play the game of optimize my scheduling problem, right, or optimize each one of their own scheduling problems, what you end up doing is kind of gamifying the whole system so that, you know, frameworks compete with each other in a, if the constraints are set right, in a healthier way. And there's a lot of kind of areas you could point out flaws with an idea like that, but there's some heft to it, I think. Um, and then I think that you could also get a pretty good kind of jump if you start looking at the hierarchical allocator or even the DRF and just say in general this should leverage historical data. So if you can look back on the historical usage of frameworks you can all of a sudden learn patterns uh, very efficiently. Uh, make, and then once you learn the patterns you can very efficiently make predictions about what is going to happen and use those predictions um, in, in terms of just choosing who to give offers to or choosing how to, like what size of offers to give. Uh, and this, the field of machine learning and stuff like that, like totally an option here with the uh, Mesos modules coming in um, and all of those really great options. So uh, that's my talk. Uh, if you want to hear more about what we do at Sailthrough, uh, I encourage you to go to my colleague uh, Jeremy Stanley's talk at 450 about building a machine learning platform to predict user behavior on Mesos. Um, thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Sorry. Am I aware of frameworks in which Mesos does not rescind offers? Um, I mean, if you look at the, well. I've seen Spark, I've seen uh, okay. I don't know, the ones that we use at work don't rescind offers currently. No. Uh, Relay.mesos, which I wrote, uh, isn't rescinding offers. 
Um, actually, we started putting everything on that. And the version of Spark I was using wasn't rescinding offers, but I'm not using an up-to-date version anymore. So I might be out of date. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so what he said was that, in case anybody couldn't hear, Mesos doesn't currently rescind offers unless master fails over or unless you set an offer timeout. Do you have a second question? Um, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. I think, I think what's... Uh, so, I think what's uh, coming in the pipe is the ability to support proper offer, uh, re like optimistic offers and ability to rescind them. I don't think it's fully out yet. So that's an interesting question. Um, so if you think about the dominant resource, right, the dominant resource is at any given point in time choosing from CPU and RAM and so on and so forth. And that choice is choosing from, you can think of it as choosing like one of many different dimensions, I guess. And it's not really, you have a good point though, it's not a multi-dimensional kind of algorithm in a way. Um, but one way you could kind of start to consider other features in there is to start looking at things over time. Um, uh, and then you could also look at other characteristics like, you know, offer rate over time. If you imagine you're trying to uh, make an educated guess, anything that uh, can inform your educated guess, uh, you could kind of make into a multidimensional model. So. Uh, does that answer the question? I kind of I kind of answered it. <laughs> but I didn't really answer it. I think I saw him over first. Uh, could you comment on how data locality is optimized? Yeah. Um, so the question is how is data locality optimized when you have competing frameworks? So uh, when you have a grid, right, and you are, say, running a task in one corner of your grid, like on one machine, okay? Uh, there's a, there's a, a feature coming into Mesos soon that will let, that was actually just mentioned in the keynote, that will let frameworks uh, basically say, I want this reserved resource. Uh, and so this is, by reserving resources, this is a way you can kind of optimize uh, your frameworks on Mesos. Um, there's a few other ways, uh, but I'm not kind of, I'm just not really comfortable in front of all of you kind of making up some things that I pull out of my head. So <laughs> I'd stick with reserved resources. No, I'm more thinking about you have the EFS, uh, HDFS there, and they, certain data are located on, you know, cluster. Oh, and then you want I see. To attack, also on those data. I see. Um, I see, so if you have a kind of, there are different strategies you can employ, right? So if you have an HDFS uh, cluster and you have your Mesos slaves, one strategy you could do is kind of intersect them a little bit so you have some slaves, agents, sorry, some agents that uh, are just agents, some agents that are also paired to HDFS and some that are just HDFS. And then using a strategy like this you can, uh, you know, benefit by the data locality here. And then, of course, you need to have some sort of like attribute system. Uh, I haven't messed too much with this uh, because we ended up just using S3 for everything um, and then keeping everything in memory. Yeah. Uh, sorry.
Yeah, so uh, as that gentleman said, you can uh, inform Spark to set a timeout that will say, I'll wait so many milliseconds until the, or seconds or something, until the, uh, until I can get the machine I want. If I don't get it in time, sorry, basically is what you said, right? Um, that has its drawbacks and its benefits, as I was saying before. The real solution to this would just be to say, like, I want to reserve these resources, uh, and then kind of kick it up to the person uh, building the framework offers, which is the master. Okay, last question. <coughs> I'm sorry, what's the question? The question was, do you consider the implications of introducing randomization into the framework offers? Yeah. So that's a really good idea. So basically, when you're trying to choose which framework to give an offer to first, right, um, you've kind of, one thing the DRF does is it just says, well, I'm always going to give this guy first and this guy second this guy third. And one thing that you could do to work around this is modify the DRF algorithm to randomly sample uh, based on your distribution uh, of weights. And if you did that, instead of just like sorting it straight up, you would get a much better, you'd get huge benefits in terms of like optimizing DRF, I would think, over time. So that's an excellent idea. Um, I've been doing work on it, but I haven't shared it with anyone. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure.